Well, uh, officially welcome, welcome to Stephen, and thanks for thanks for finding time to speak to us. And we're going to talk on socio-spatial networks. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks to the the rest of the organisers of uh, of this for um, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm I've been trying to do a little bit of editing as I've listened um, to to other talks this morning, so I hope um, there's a few different things in here i can't see the chat as we go um so i'll try and leave room for questions at the end um and uh but if i if i do say something that just glaringly needs correcting or clarifying especially if you're a a, a, a colleague that i've known for a while please uh or, or anyone else just just jump in and stop me um presenting on zoom is a is a kind of unique thing um so that what i'm gonna do hopefully over the next 20 or so minutes is just explain why how this talk is motivated by the current COVID-19 pandemic. Very briefly show um, an old example of a socio-spatial network that we made for smallpox and that I created some uh, code for a while ago. And then I'll go on uh, to spend kind of the meat of the talk looking at one specific project um, that's uh, it, it's current. It's just gone up as a revised preprint pre onto BioArchive um, about how um, certain properties of, of social spatial networks can lead to non-standard epidemics. So um, referencing back to an earlier talk this morning, how we'll get curves that wouldn't be well estimated by a simple SEIR model. And I'll try and explain how the network structure um, feeds through to, to give these non-standard epidemic dynamics. And then at the end, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we'll have time um, for some discussion or I can just merge into the, the general discussion afterwards. So that's, those are the uh, four parts for the, for the next few minutes. So this, before this, we're not talking about a sexually transmitted infection where the, um, the mechanism for transmission and the contact for transmission is really clearly defined. STI networks can be difficult to, to describe because people getting the accurate information is difficult, but they have a very precisely defined um, transmission event. What I want to talk about just for a second is that respiratory infections don't have quite as clearly defined a transmission event. So the top left of this slide shows a flu um, epidemic curve from 09 um, and we know that it's transmitted from person to person we know the mechanisms are aerosol or respiratory droplet we can I we know lots of things about flu that we've we've now learned about COVID-19 and this transmission produces epidemics and we understand some of the some of the underlying mechanisms for those epidemics and the picture on the top right that's people sneeze droplets get in the air that's how um, that's how flu gets around, and that's how COVID gets around. Then, bottom right, you can see this network diagram of kind of flight paths and connectivity around Europe. So, we do understand the kind of network of respiratory transmission at large scales. So, we can kind of look at flight volumes. We can look at incidents in one place, incidents in another, and we can kind of estimate how quickly respiratory pathogens will move over long distances because they've got to go, they've got to travel with people. And the final picture in the kind of bottom left, if we're going around in a clockwise, um, is a lecture theater, which is how we used to give presentations. And obviously right now, none of, no one on this call has any high risk of getting infected by me if I was COVID positive. But if we were in a lecture theater, like the picture in the bottom left, it'd be really difficult to know for sure how much more likely someone in the front one row was to be infected by me than someone in the back row if I were infectious. So the social contacts that are actually directly relevant for respiratory pathogens are much more difficult defi to define them for other infections. I just wanted to kind of um, say that up front. But um, we do know that social networks exist and we know that it travels from person to person based on face-to-face -face contact most of the time. So this slide is taken from a paper that appeared um, during the response by the uh, Fraser Group in Oxford. It's Farah Tietal from Science. And this is one of the pieces of work that's motivated the interest in contact tracing as a way to reduce the reproduction number for COVID. 
And the point they're making on this slide is, is very straightforward. We understand, if you look at the top row, the different contexts where um, transmission may occur. And if we had really good fast contact tracing on the bottom part of the slide, they show how people could be isolated um, and how you could reduce the average number of onward transmissions um, if we had very good contact tracing. And this is implicit in this is the existence of a contact network over which we could contact trace. So, um, and moving forward, that's going to be a major part of our thinking and, and the scientific questioning of the response all over and especially in the UK. And then slightly, <clears throat> slightly nervous even about the next slide. And we will be using models to look at this. Um, so I'm just putting up, a, a, it's not the first time this morning, um, an example um, output from the, um, the individual base model from Imperial College. This is a code base developed primarily by Neil Ferguson and a, and a, and a team over a number of years. Um, and this type of approach is being used to look at specific intervention options. This report doesn't deal with contact tracing, um, but those features are also included in these large code bases. And there's, as has already been mentioned today, it's difficult to completely disentangle exactly how these things um, are implemented in any one set of code. Um, and I think everyone would agree that we need multiple tools and maybe even multiple kind of theoretical approaches to look at the general question of the interaction of a disease transmission process on a contact network with some kind of case-based intervention. Um, so to kind of try and wrap it up, um, the motivation into just very specific questions that we're going to need to try to answer in the next few weeks and months. Um, we want to know how effective is contact tracing actually being with the app or without the app in the other guises that it will be used. Um, we want to understand how clusters should be investigated, workplaces, schools, other settings, um, how we should prioritize them and how effective those cluster investigations are being at reducing transmission. And I'm, just, I'm not going to try and answer those today. These are motivating the more kind of detailed results that I'm gonna give. And then, I, and then I think that does motivate a kind of independent need for very good socio-spatial networks. And so by a socio-spatial network, I'll give a narrow definition for this talk. It's having, having a representation of where people live as, so that where they sleep each night is their location in space. And then people that they contact, individuals they contact through either school or workplace or some other way, they are linked by an arc. So people live at a place in a household, they're a node. And then the people that they contact are on the other end of an arc. And if you've got contacts between people, that's a social network. And if each node is located in space, then it's a social, I'm going to, I'm going to call that a social spatial network. And I think that there's, there's a lot of need for, there's some interesting questions that we can try to answer and we need to generate really good versions of these. Okay. So very quickly, um, the, this is motivated by what is kind of, oh, sorry. I've now realized that I have, um, I was trying to look at the time, but I realized I've obviously, because I'm on desktop sharing. Um, so just to kind of flash up an example from 2006, when um, it was in the early 2000s, people were actually worried about deliberate release of, of smallpox. The general conclusion that was that we didn't need to worry about that for the reasons that would gotten rid of smallpox were the reasons why it would be straightforward to, um, not straightforward, but why it was unlikely would have very large outbreaks of smallpox if it were to reemerge for any reason. Um, but in the course of thinking about that, we did look at large spatial models with a social network overlaid on them and with a contact tracing process. Um, and this slide shows how uh, a kind of baseline for how smallpox may have spread in the UK. Um, and although the colors look a little bit scary, the, the bottom line from, from this slide is that even in our kind of most pessimistic scenarios, smallpox would have spread really slowly with relatively low incidence 
pretty much everywhere, even if it wasn't responded to. And what we went on to show with this is the contact tracing um, and isolation would be extremely effective um, at controlling smallpox because there was such a long time from infection to the beginning of infectiousness. Um, so that's the kind of his, that's the example um, that I'm going to build on for the for the rest of the talk. So jumping forward now, um, and this is uh, the picture here is 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 not me. If you're not looking at the screen, that's David Hoare, um, who's worked on this in in our group and has done a fantastic job. So um, uh, I want to give him credit before I dive into the the details of this uh, current paper. Um, and the for this section, there's a there are I want to get more into some of kind of the interesting disease dynamic science that we can get from studying um, social spatial networks. The first one is the exponential growth, which is a feature of many different epidemic models, may not be common under some conditions, and it's possible that those conditions might be. Um, present in the UK at the present time, although certainly not guaranteed. I'll talk a little bit about how the absence of exponential growth means that the reproduction number is not always well defined. Um, and then I'll move on to look at some specific networks where contacts are made only very locally and long distance contacts are very rare um, and talk about measures of clustering on those networks. So very, and I'll, I'll explain clustering as we go through it. And then as a kind of general point, um, what I'd like to flag here is a specific example of an opportunity for novel algorithms. There's something, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of this work that is just figuring out how to create a network that's representative of what you know about how people travel and what you know about where people live. And it's a fairly tricky computational task. Um, and I just want to flag that uh, in these next few slides. And um, so the this is, um, as I've said, uh, that's the reference on BioArchive um, for the results in this section. And all of the code, all the results I'm going to talk about are uh, immediately reproducible from this repository which is public, and there should be, there should also be a Zenodo kind of release of the code um, in the preprint. If it's not actually in the preprint and it's not obvious from the current version of the code, then please email me if you do want to look at it, and I can give you the Zenodo link for the um, for the bioarchive uh, preprint. So, what kind of more specifically? what what is the network model that this is going to be based on and the, so we assume that we have good knowledge of the population density for any five kilometer by five kilometer grid how many people live in that grid and we assume that we know that for both households and for workplaces or schools or you know these are uh, contexts where you meet the same people and you create social social links um, and if we want to do that for the whole of the UK or for some kind of small population, um, we can make a model where we just randomly assign workplace, uh, we assign workplaces um, according to their known density, we assign households according to their known density, and then we randomly assign people from households to workplaces. Um, but that's not much use. That will give you exactly the same dynamics as SEIR, and when you run it, it won't give the um, realistic spatial dynamics. You won't see that propagation through space that you saw that was on the, the smallpox example. So um, the way this uh, code works is that there's a we've got a specific implementation of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm that you need to run for a long time on a large population, and it will um, go through. Um, I hope you can see my. I think you normally can with Zoom. Um, so, and and what this algorithm does is it goes through every assignment. These are households, these are workplaces, and it goes through every assignment from some person in a household to a workplace, and then proposes that they move to a different workplace, and then sees if 
if you move that person from one workplace to an uh, to another does their new journey to work is that more consistent with what we know about the patterns of how people travel to work than their previous journey to work and if it is more consistent according to the precise accept reject of metropolis hastings then probabilistically then we move them and if it's not with the accept reject condition then we then we leave them where they were and we just run that accept reject more and more time until we obtain a distribution um a, a stable distribution of people's journey to work and um the functional form the functional form that we use to do that follows this uh, uh the formula on the screen at the moment so here the kernel um is a function of the distance between the person and the workplace divided by some offset and then raised to a power alpha in this work the offset part of this isn't really important you can imagine that your propensity to travel any given distance to go to work is proportional to one over the distance raised to the power alpha so here the larger alpha is the less likely you are to travel and the smaller alpha is the less likely you are to travel longer distances and the uh, and the smaller alpha is then um uh, the more likely uh, you are to travel um so you run the algorithm for a long time and then once everybody's once you've got a stable set of distributions dissolve the um the workplaces and just link up so if this person is connected through here to here to this person then dissolve the workplace and just replace it with a link so we get left with a unipartite network of households and links between them at the moment there's only one type of workplace and one type of household but in general there's no reason that workplaces can't be done for different age groups or different individual types and um and networks generate and and repeatedly the algorithm run repeatedly to generate networks for lots of different contexts and this is just a flag that the the details of the algorithm that we use for that are um are given in pseudocode as well as in the actual um uh, git repo in that old paper so the example that we then that we use this on this is a pre-covid example and um, was actually a population um, of a million people living um in and near to monrovia um in west africa because the motivating example was was actually dynamics that we saw for um uh for the ebola outbreak and these charts show the distance distributions between individuals and their workplaces for the different powers of alpha so when alpha is equal to zero the distance doesn't make any difference at all and it's just a random allocation the reason it doesn't look uniform is because the population density is not uniform so the location of workplaces and the location of homes gives you a um if you have random allocation it results in this set of journeys and then as you increase alpha you're making it less likely that people travel longer distances so you're making things be much more local so therefore you get a higher frequency of shorter journeys and then increasingly more so for even higher values of alpha note that there's a massive difference between these two powers and there is a difference on here but it's not immediately obvious to the eye on these frequency plots but that's a that's a much higher value of alpha in the kind of range of values that we use so the next section is we're just going to kind of um go through um gonna have to just check time again okay good eye on that um so i'm going to try and make two points in this in these next sections before i kind of wrap up and go to discussion so the first one is about exponential growth um and that, we had a meeting a few years ago um and we had a spatial subgroup and we had lots of fantastic discussions about on and exponential growth um and this kind of reflects back a little bit to those so this is a, a definite uh, follow-on from previous newton institute um, interactions so in general if you just look at raw incidents of um and these these schematics show raw incidents it's not immediately obvious whether one curve is exponential growth or it's not but as i'm sure every single person on on this call that's fine we just plot incidents on a log scale and if we get a straight line then we've got exponential growth and if we get something that's not straight 
then it's probably it's not exponential growth so that's one way to see whether we're in a kind of uh, an exponential regime um another way of thinking about that is that the gradient of the line of the of the exponential line is constant so that's just saying the the same thing but looking at the at the derivative um rather than the uh rather than the the linearity or the, the absence of uh, of curve and then in this framework we have an a third way that we can think about exponential growth because this is an individual base model so we can extract exactly who instruct who infects who because we're simulating the epidemic spreading so we know generation zero those are the seeds that we fed in we know generation one and we know generation two in real life you very very rarely know that in you know in theory with lots of genotyping we could maybe do that for an epidemic one day um but that means that we can look at the number of people the ratio um of the number of people in the second generation compared to the number of people in the first generation so this is the second generation and this is the ratio of people in the second generation compared to the ratio in the first generation and that if you think more generally for um uh renewal processes that is actually the definition of an exponential process is that it renews with exactly the same ratio each time so we can directly observe renewal because we're observing generations um, from the code and if you don't have constant ratios between generations again then it's not a it's not an exponential regime so what we've done with this ebola like epidemic in west africa with varying degrees of locality if you like so alpha equals zero is mass is mass action no space really alpha equals three is kind of quite typical or you know slightly more local interactions than random and then alpha equals six is extremely random people not moving far at all and um, so those are the three columns and then we can look at incidents in these different ways and assess the degree of uh, the duration of exponential growth um, for the and kind of what the values of r naught might be um so I'll, I'll speed up a little bit here's the incidence plotted this incidence on a linear scale incidence on a log scale where it kind of looks exponential like although it's kind of hard to tell by eye on the right hand side this is the gradient um, um, of the log of incidence um, where there's a lot of noise obviously because there's noise at the beginning of the process here um, but the duration of the flat gradient is definitely going down and then this is the generational observation so is it definitely renewal and there's a couple of important features on here the first one is it takes a while to kind of reach its eigenstate if you like um, and i know peter trapman's on the phone here and we've given uh, peter lots of credit in the preprint for kind of defining this little plateau here as the true um r naught for for these network models so it's, it's his r sub star that we're claiming as r naught there but that really doesn't exist that much when you move up to alpha equals three it's still there and then when you move to alpha equals six it's just not there the, you know this is not the first time it's been observed network models of any by any sense but there isn't a, a period for which r naught is well defined so can we look delve a little bit into the properties of the network using kind of more traditional network science um, ideas so and see whether we can um, kind of generalize a little bit as to what's going on here why what are the features of the network that are restricting uh, that are generating these non-typical dynamics and I'm, this the, in the this is a little bit more technical and I, um, um, but I, I think it will be of interest to, to to quite a few people on the on the call so the degree distribution is just how many friends do i have you know the average it's the it's the distribution of the number of contacts that somebody makes the classic clustering coefficient is how many of my friends know each other so and it's a measure of how much the network closes in on itself at that first opportunity so it's just a measure of friends of friends and there's been a lot of work on that and then what we're going to look at is how the alpha affects these and to do that we need to generalize the clustering coefficient to higher orders so um 
what that essentially does is you just is we this idea of my friends how many of my friends know each other just gets repeated but rather than using actual friends what we say is for for say an order three clustering we'll see we'll go to everybody that's within that's either one two or three away and then we'll kind of we'll delete all of those internal links and we'll just pretend that one two or three is the same as one link and we'll say how many of those were also clustering so that's an order three clustering and order four clustering is higher than that and higher than that there are a lot of similar um metrics in the network literature but the there's a little bit of variation in them as well so we're very precise about what we've done um in the preprint and that suggests when you look at the behavior of those clustering coefficients um, with uh, if you look at the behavior of the clustering coefficients for different distance powers so for different degrees of locality where it's mass action on the left here and really strong spatial clustering on the right then what you see is that the straightforward clustering is completely unaffected as you'd expect it's kind of by definition it actually is by definition in the, in the model and then even the second order clustering doesn't make any difference as you go up third order clustering you see in slight increase in clustering when alpha goes past two three four but then fourth order clustering um you see this massive increase in the way the network folds back in on itself at four links as you increase the power of alpha um, and if you go to higher order networks it's 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 obviously stronger and on so we see that very strong impact of alpha on clustering coefficients from four and then the the chart on the right is a is a slightly dense way of saying well does that make any difference to the actual properties of the epidemic and so what we're plotting on the y-axis here is the peak size of the epidemic divided by the final size we noticed that it was apparently kind of um it it, it was kind of behaving in a fairly uh, constrained way for some circumstance so we look we explain more about it in the paper so what we've done is we've looked at all the same kind of sets of parameter values here um for and we've looked at the relationship between the moments for different powers of alpha and different um values for this ratio and so for example um we've looked at whether first order clustering appears to affect peak final size when that's kind of the only thing that is changing and you can see these are these are completely vertical here so as you go through um uh uh all the different powers of alpha which are the numbers here so that's alpha one alpha two alpha three alpha four it's um it's changing the relationship in a perfectly um kind of linear way in a whilst keeping the value of that uh, clustering coefficient constant but as you look at the higher um values for the clustering coefficient you see that they become more and more influential even across different powers of alpha until you're getting this very very strong relationship between um, the properties of the fourth order clustering across a wide range of alpha in how it affects this kind of summary statistic for epidemics so i'll move on that's uh, possibly a bit dense to squeeze into the uh, a kind of wide-ranging talk but um i hope that of established exponential growth may not be common under some conditions that might be interesting um higher order clustering can explain that in the bipartite framework it's a unipartite network but a bipartite framework of households and workplaces that we've used and that this general space is an opportunity for some kind of cool novel algorithms um and that was the end of the results i have some suggestions for discussion um, but i'm just going to put those up on the screen and stop um, because I have used all of my time and we're going into discussion anyway so I will just put those up on the screen and I'll stop there and and take any questions thank you very much
Um, well, first, are there any immediate specific questions on Stephen's presentation? Which many thanks. Um, um, I have one. I'll ask one. It's Deirdre. Hi, Stephen. Hey, Deirdre. How are you? I'm good. I love your shed. Um, <laughs> I just, this is a great talk. Lots of lovely stuff in it. Thank you. So what's for people who are not epidemiological modelers, like there's a lot of detail about networks in there, but how well do we know about networks and what are our best? It's an obvious question. Sorry. Where are the best data streams for that kind of information now? So for the, we've, we've tried really hard over the years. We've got some good stuff from Fluescape, um, the spatial distribution in China, but, the bottom line is the the best data that exists are must now be from the Isle of Wight. They've got working Bluetooth links between phones with a thirty percent penetration into a population of one hundred forty thousand. So we've never had anything like that before. So there does now exist a you know a, a biased and not representative thirty percent sample of a of a of a social network in a closed population. That's got to be it. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, uh, we'd be nice. There's lots to discuss, so let's have 20 minutes of breakouts and then. Um, and there are still two people with raised hands at least. So uh, okay, that's the trouble with not being able to see them. Uh, okay. Adam, and perhaps Adam can. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, great talk and lots. I've got lots of questions, but I'll focus on one. Um, your point about ah, oh, I think I think it's a really kind of good one, and and, and the kind of um, what are we actually trying to trying to capture in terms of growth. I mean, in, in terms of evaluating interventions, a lot of people are looking at kind of changes in the reproduction number. Do you feel of kind of the different metrics you're presenting, there's probably a better one or a better combination we could be using? I, I think that if we're, in a, if we're in a regime that's close to RT equals one, and there's an interaction of household saturation and kind of infrequent between, ha between household um contacts i don't know there's a really obvious replacement for uh for r and i and i think that maybe what we need is is really clean parsimonious simulation models that with no more detail in at all than they absolutely need to try and evaluate further disruptions to either household or between household um so i, I think the, i don't know I don't know that there's a really good replacement, but I, but that doesn't necessarily mean we, we have to absolutely stick with it. That maybe we should be, you know, specking out some really clean um, household models where we can we can test um, the potential contribution of different uh, interventions. Over. Okay. Cheers. That's, that's not a good idea. Um, a great, great comment on that, Steve. Would be, I mean, as I'm sure you know, in, in a in a completely spatial model with let's say just nearest neighbor spread, then basically R is always, if the thing is above threshold, the thing R is essentially gonna be one. So you can't really tell how good it is at spreading. Um, that's a, you know, if it's spreading out as a little circumference of a circle. But, uh, so, yeah. uh, so, 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 so R is still in a sense useful, but, but we maybe yeah, need to think of other things. But, and I, I have other questions I would ask, but we have people in front of me. So it's Pavel wanted to ask a question. Pavel? Yeah. So first of all, excellent talk. Uh, so I, I'm, in a few days, I'm going to be talking about also bipartite networks, and it's going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, so uh, my thinking is, uh, was actually along the same line as Deidre's question, was that sort of what kind of data one could get about that. And my sense is that one could actually uh, piggyback on general social survey data by maybe getting a, a basically getting, a, getting a, using that to estimate sort of the global network features and then trying to um, sort of calibrate the, calibrate the network model unipartite or bipartite to match those features at least that, that's that's been my thinking I don't know how, how do, you, do you think this guy this the, the framework you have could be amenable to that? sort of calibration yeah i so um 
Yeah, I think it is. And I, I mean, maybe wasn't clear because it was a little bit rushed, but so we do use commuting data for that pro to fit that propensity okay. function. And okay. then you, when I showed how you fit the distribution of commutes, there's, there's no reason that the, the algorithm, the accept rejects algorithm could take any oh. kind of pseudo likelihood. So you could explicitly mm -hmm. impose the full commuting network for the UK as your like, uh, you could make a likelihood out of that. So you could get as close to that as possible. So yeah, I think that's a that's a really good idea. I think the the difficult thing is is like the number of contacts that really matter, and the proportion of those that are random. So the like how many people are going to get it from the tube? We, the proportion of people who are getting it from the tube is a key thing in any of these, and and, it, and that's the more difficult thing to find. I think I'm not sure. And, that. and one more thing, it's sort of a trivial question. Uh, uh, the screen you were sharing was very small, so the paper you were you just posted was social networks of strong spatial embedding generate non standard epidemic dynamics driven by hardware clustering. Is that the paper you were discussing? Yes, yeah, so that should be yeah, the bio okay, some bio okay, archive, yeah, not. Yeah. yeah, okay, because it, uh, I was look, watching it at a very low resolution, so I kind of. Sorry, and just a, a quick, very quick comment back to Dennis before um, Peter jumps in. There, I didn't talk about it today. We've, we've done a deterministic approximation of how it maps onto wave dynamics as well. You, you can get the whole thing back to waves in households and between them. And there's some nice maths in there, that, um, but I didn't go through it today. That sounds fun. Um, were there any, was there one more question? I think Peter was. Well, I just posted something in the chat, so. Uh... There is a way to define R, I would say, even if you have a space, purely spatial model, which is by seeing the fraction of the infection rate compared to the um, to the critical in what would be the critical infection rate. Of course, that would be it's cheating because finding that critical infection rate is very hard, but we got a lot of computers now, so that maybe that comes back to Adam's point that that's how we define it. And until we can do some really cool maths that Lorenzo might be interested in, then we just simulate the heck out of it. And, and that's, and that's what we work with. So, yep. Thanks. This uh, uh, definition, uh, by the way, is not mine. It came from, it was suggested by Mark Hancock once. Oh, well, you're well, enjoy the credit in our preprint and we'll, correct it if we get the chance. <laughs> okay. Um, what else